Good afternoon, everyone. Let's see, can you hear me? Yes. I'm gonna stand on my tippy toes. Um, welcome. I'm Beth Saunders, curator and head of special collections at the Albino Kuhn Library. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to the public event and reception honoring the exhibition Experimentalist, the Art of Robert W. Fichter. Yes. <laughs> This retrospective traces the artist's exploration of the human condition across multiple mediums and highlights an artistic approach that is characterized by curiosity, experimentation, expressiveness, and wit. The works on display created between 1962 and 2006 are drawn entirely from the Robert W. Fichter archive at UMBC. In 2006, the artist donated his archive of photographs, paintings, drawings, prints, lectures, and source material to UMBC's special collections. I'm grateful to my predecessor, Tom Beck, the curator of this exhibition, who stewarded the donation of this remarkable collection, and also to David Yeager, who helped make this donation possible. I'm especially grateful to Robert and Nancy Fichter for entrusting us with a life's work. Um, and for joining us here this evening. <laughs> I also want to thank everyone who came out tonight, and especially Robert's friends and colleagues, many of whom traveled very far to be with us this evening. Um, I'd like to thank Emily Halver for the beautiful installation of the exhibition and for her assistance with many details, large and small, that made the exhibition and this program tonight <coughs> possible. I'd also like to thank Larry Halver and Vincent Carney, who ably assisted with preparing and hanging the works. And I'm very appreciative of my team in special collections, Susan Graham, Lindsay Laper, and Robin Martin, who have supported this exhibition in innumerable ways. Finally, I'd like to give a special thanks to today's speakers, Tom Beck, Eileen Cowan, and Adam Strauss, who will be sharing their thoughts on various aspects of this versatile artist's career and discussing his personal impact as a colleague and as a mentor. Just a little word on the order of events. I'll briefly introduce each speaker before their talk, and I'll ask that you just please reserve comments and questions till the end. I imagine that there were gonna be a lot of stories and a lot of memories to share, so we can continue the conversation in the reception to follow. Um, so our first speaker today will be the exhibition's curator, Tom Beck. Tom Beck is Chief Curator Emeritus and Affiliate Associate Professor of Art at UMBC. He's the author of more than two dozen books and catalogs, including Music of the Mind, Cliché Vert Photographs, and Digital Imagery of Jaramir Stephanie, David Seymour Chim, and An American Vision, John G. Bullock and the Photo Secession. He has been invited to lecture at institutions such as the George Eastman House, the National Gallery of Art, National Archives, Ohio State University, and the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Photography. He's curated more than 200 exhibitions, served as a panelist for the National Endowment of the Arts and the Maryland State Arts Council, and he currently serves as the chair of the Maryland State Historical Records Advisory Board. Among his awards are a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Baltimore Camera Club and an Emmy Award from the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Beth, for that charming exhibition introduction. And it's a real honor to be here and to be giving this talk about this beautiful exhibition, wonderfully prepared by Beth and, um, and Emily and Larry and others. But it's a special honor to be speaking about Robert Fichter's work with Robert and Nancy here today. Let's have another hand for them. My presentation uh, will cover two areas, uh, considering the art of Robert Fichter. The first is, who is Robert Fichter? And secondly, uh, why is his work important?
first for some background. Um, Robert is, the, is a fourth generation Floridian whose family members were pioneers in uh, southwestern Florida. When they arrived there, there were only 10 families living in Fort Myers, Florida. So a very long time ago and a lot of history in that family with Florida. Robert's father and mother uh, were both rural Floridians with backgrounds from uh, University of Florida. Father had a math, uh, an undergraduate and master's degree. His mother had an undergraduate degree from University of Florida and a graduate degree from Auburn University. Uh, his father worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture at different places around Florida and his mother became a school teacher wherever the family happened to be. His sister, seven years older than he, uh, was a, had a bachelor's degree in art from University of Florida and a master's in, uh, from Auburn University. Um, Victor once said, I learned to be an artist from my mother who always wanted to sit down and write the great American novel and from my sister I learned the secrets of non-objective art. So Robert uh, was always the, the kid in school who drew the Christmas uh, decorations, who drew the turkey at Thanksgiving. He had a, a passion for drawing as a youngster. And here we see one of his early drawings. This is Lars washing dish by the Caloosahatchee, the river that empties into the Gulf of Mexico or the bays before you get to the Gulf of Mexico by Fort Myers, Florida. And um, they were on an outing next to the river and it's not surprising because the natural landscape has always been a favorite subject of Robert's and uh, he's always been an ardent advocate for the uh, environment, protecting the environment. As a youngster, he would often be found by a river or a lake uh, knee or knee deep in a swamp uh, searching for native fish to add to his home aquariums. Uh, his intention was to become a naturalist. At the University of Florida, Victor initially sought to study anthropology with noted, uh, noted, uh, noted naturalists. Uh, his goal was to become uh, a naturalist himself. He was interested in the pursuit of creative writing also, and he became the editor of a campus um, literary magazine. And on a visit to the apartment of one of the fellows that was writing for the magazine, um, he noticed some photographs that were hung around the apartment area and asked the, the student, uh, well, who made these pictures? He said, well, he had. He had taken a class in photography on campus. And um, I think the very next day, Robert went across campus to the art department to find out about taking a photography class. So he gets to the art department and uh, he meets Jerry Ulsman. Jerry Ulsman, who at that time was becoming nationally known and later became internationally known as a photographer. But Victor signed up for a photography class uh, with Ulsman. And um, he began studying um, the, the rapidly developing uh, art photography world that uh, Ulsman opened up to him. Through Ulsman, Victor also uh, met the and was impressed with the legendary uh, photography professor Henry Holmes Smith and uh, considered then to be one of the leading uh, philosophers, mentors, writers, and photographers. And he also met through, through Ullsman, Nathan Lyons, a rising uh, curator at the George Eastman House in Rochester, New York. About 1963, while he was still at University of Florida, Victor photographed toys for the first time and one of the assignments that he had for one of Yulesman's classes. And the toys that he photographed were for a series called Battle of the Trolls. And that depicted these troll figures and toy soldiers. The use of toys was um, a first for Victor and the coming of, in the coming years, of course, became uh, a um, significant part of Fichter's work. He developed a cast of critters and characters. Among the critters, 
uh, in Fichter's work was winged flying dog, shown here with a uh, drawing that has been photographed with actual flowers. And if we look over here, we'll see, you can see the actual flowers here, but the way that the image fits together, uh, it creates this wonderful three-dimensional space uh, with the color and uh, it's kind of layered in, in, in the way the space works so three-dimensionally. Anyway, Fichter wrote a paper at about that time uh, called The Contrived Image in Modern Photography. And he said, the task of the modern photographer working with the contrived image is to see symbols that offer meaning and meanings over a great span of aesthetics so that the image gets to the viewer, that gets to the viewer's gut before he can turn away. Uh, these words indeed uh, predicted future, future work for Robert. Fichter went to Indiana University and indeed studied for his MFA, which he received in 1966, with uh, studying with Henry Holmes Smith. His MFA was titled Notes from the Biological and Psychological Garden, which combined his concerns for humanity with the natural environment and, of course, his inner terrain. His thesis exhibition was made up of figurative prints, etchings, and, and lithographs, as well as photographs. And it clearly showed that he was uh, fascinated by process. So with his degree uh, in the offing, he was hired at the George Eastman House by Nathan Lyons to be an assistant curator of photographs. So off he went to Rochester. And in 1967 and 1968, uh, he happened to go to a shopping center in Rochester where Kodak Verifax, copy, Verifax copiers were being sold off with the supplies. Uh, and uh, it was just affordable enough that even those paid with the modest salaries at Eastman House could afford them. And he and Thomas Barrow, his office mate at Eastman House, uh, bought a uh, amount of things to make images. And this is one of the images he made with that equipment. And what it is is a kind of a satire where you see, let's see here. Hard to read, but it, it talks about the feeding the feeding the cuts of beef to soldiers and it also talks about the um, clogging of one's arteries from such meager cuts of meat. Of meat. So uh, this, the satire was part of Robert's work, uh, especially at that time. Victor met UCLA professor Robert Heineken at the Eastman House uh, at a seminar hosted by Nathan Lyons. And Heineken uh, spoke on the manipulated image and discovered a kindred spirit in Robert Victor. Heineken was so excited by Fichter and his work that when he got back to UCLA, he immediately convinced the department that they should hire Robert. And uh, Fichter enjoyed his work at the Eastman House, but he was ready for the next step. So he goes to California, and of course in California, there's a, a developing art photography community uh, that was not large, uh, but was best known for people like Ansel Adams and Edward Weston and other traditionalists. But through Heineken, Fichter soon met image manipulators such as Todd Walker uh, and local, a local, local professional photographer uh, whose personal work was what he called funny pictures, quote unquote. Uh, Walker was a consummate craftsman and was on the faculty at UCLA and taught Robert how to make cyanotypes or blueprints. And as we can see, this is the, one of the images that came out of that experience. Uh, Robert combined uh, blueprints with gum printing on, in this image uh, 19, 19, in 1970. That was the year 
that uh, the Vietnam War was so roiling campuses across uh, the country, but all especially UCLA. Among Victor's critters and char uh, characters was Bones, created in 1980. Bones, who talks via captions and uh, cartoon balloons, is sometimes partnered with Miss Bones uh, her, uh, and their child, Baby Gene Pool. I love that name, Baby Gene Pool. Uh, a mutant diaper-wearing cyclops created by, quote, better living through electricity and chemistry, which is a, a variant of the famous DuPont uh, company advertising slogan, better things for better living through chemistry. So uh, close enough for, for that satire to be effective. In Bones to Baby Gene Pool, it's just like life flashing before your eyes, lithograph 1982, uh, we see a narrative image with the cowboy as a prominent symbol of American independence and down-to-earth wisdom. Like Bones, um, uh, likewise, Bones represents human mortality and the tragic course of human activity, while Baby Gene Pool represents the alternative, uh, of the al alteration rather, of the American genetic makeup and threats to unborn life forms. Also shown is Born Again Art Ass, a symbol of the narrow-mindedness that seeks to perpetuate the status quo, especially in art. And we see AT&T's Ma Bell maternally controlling the U.S. from coast to coast while looking down goddess-like on surrogates for Jonah and the whale. The genius of Robert Fichter's work is in his creative creativity, craft, and effective presentation of narrative elements. He wants his viewers to think intensely about the human condition and many circumstances affecting it. Other kinds of work not in this exhibition include large-scale paintings and short films that Robert made over his career. The painting shown here is audience number one, acrylic on canvas, and it's nearly seven by nine feet in size. Uh, this work not only presents emotional depth, but also has narrative content and popular cultural themes, and evokes well-known uh, expressionists such as Hieronymus Bosch, Odilon Redon, Edvard Munch, and James Enzer. Victor's painting reveals the tragic comedy of life with mask-like subjects that are both amusing and frightening. As noted, process has always been important to Fichter, so it is not surprising that he has, was among the first to acquire an Apple Macintosh computer with the Apple Mac Paint program when the computer and software came onto the market <coughs> in uh, 1984. Fichter was, uh, Fichter's first body of work, of course, was devoted to his lead character, Bones, and others in the cast of characters. Among the mature works in this uh, computer-generated image, um, contemporary Florida landscape, which has a bi bifurcated space, a strategy which Victor had used in some of his earliest work uh, and successfully employed then as well as now. The spoiled landscape is weighed upon by the dark cloud containing a scary-looking Mr. Bones with Mr. Bass in the role of the whale in the Jonah and the Whale story and a soldier stealthily emerging from the wide mouth of the bass in the presence of two other fishes out of water. So to answer the question, why, uh, who is Robert Fichter? He is an artist for whom his family heritage is important. His studies with Yulesman Smith and Lyons are significant and whose artworks are masterpieces of process and their message about the human condition needing to be heard by all. The image I have shown represents, the image, all the images I have shown represent important turning points in the Robert Fichter's, in Robert Fichter's art and life. Finally, why is Robert Fichter's work so important? A few of the reasons are, Fichter is a pioneering artist trained not only in photography, but also 
alternative processes, painting and printmaking, who contributed greatly in breaking photography out of its isolation up to the up to 1960s from all other media. He has made, secondly, extraordinarily original and groundbreaking images which provide social, cultural, and political critiques on such subjects as the environment, war, nuclear weapons, and much, much more. Thirdly, he has brought entirely new approaches to symbol making to contemporary art. Fourthly, he has been a highly influential and important uh, teacher in working with students and helping others in understanding art and, and making art. And finally, fifth, it serves, he ser it serves us and, his, and the art world well to know Fichter's work in understanding the ev evolution of contemporary art and what, it, and what comes next. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Eileen Cowan is a photographer and video artist based in Los Angeles. She's presented work internationally in over 30 solo exhibitions and more than 165 group exhibitions. Her work is included in the collections of major public and private institutions, such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the J. Paul Getty Museum, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the National Gallery of Canada, and more close to home, the Baltimore Museum of Art and UMBC's photography collections. Cowan has received numerous awards, including multiple photographers' fellowship grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, an award for Best Experimental Film at the USA Film Festival, and an individual artist grant from the City of Los Angeles. Her work has been commissioned by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Public Art Fund, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, the Los Angeles World Airports Art Commission, and she was the inaugural artist for the Metro Rail Light Boxes in Los Angeles. Cowan taught at Franconia College in New Hampshire from 1971 to 1975 and at California State Fullerton from 1975 to 2008. She's a longtime friend and colleague of Roberts who first met the artist in 1970. Today, she will be speaking about the artistic community of which she and Robert were part and sharing some personal memories. Eileen. So you can just forward and backward. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh yeah, that's good. Okay, so I said to Robert, I'm a little nervous talking in front of you about you. And he just looked at me and said, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I just thought I would tell you a little guide to my talk. Think of it as trains, two trains on parallel tracks running beside each other. They're not intersecting, so I have one tr train, which is my photographs, and the other train, which are my stories, which I've collected from some former students of his and friends, because I thought it would be interesting to hear what some of these people who worked with Robert almost 50 years ago had to say about his influence. Okay, so, um, <laughs> This is Robert in graduate school, by the way. Okay, although any time is a good time to be looking at Robert's work, Microphone. I think this time is particularly a great time. And it just reminded me um, that he, did a, he was part of a symposium in Newport Beach in 1979. And it was with Betty Hahn and with Henry Holmes Smith, who was his teacher. And he gets up there and he pulls out a, a newspaper and he starts reading all the horrible things that happened in the newspaper. This is in 1979. So first I thought, should I do a tribute to Robert, you know, and pull out a newspaper and start reading all the horrible things that have happened? And then I thought we would be here 
all night and maybe into tomorrow if I did that right now. Um, this is a picture of Daryl Kern and Todd Walker and Robert. Um, I, I kind of stole a lot. Daryl Kern is here. I stole a lot from his stash, so you might see a lot of Daryls. Okay, so some things you need to, I'm standing on my tiptoe and it's a little uncomfortable, okay. Some things um, you need to know about Robert. Um, like all the work is beautiful and there are things that he really wants you to pay attention to. Someone said that his work um, was about his process was a form of social protest and you might see that in work from 1971, the Florida bomb sites or uh, the 1970 xenotype and gum print, a new photograph of a successful weapon of war. He was an obsessive emailer, obsessive emailer, so um, of strange and obscure things. For instance, I'm a twin and he would send me things about twins and one time he said, and here's something for your collection of twin obituaries. But I don't have a collection of twin obituaries, but, but he started me on my collection of that, okay. Or then there was a subject heading which said, um, here's what happened when I tried to paint like Bob Ross. One. Or then there would be links to um, strange cameras for sale, Daryl probably got those as well, that he would say, I think you need this. And they were really the most obscure cameras ever. And then my favorite subject heading from an email from Robert was, more than a quarter of voters in Florida rule out the po don't rule out the possibility that Ted Cruz is the Zodiac Killer. <laughs> you can see the mustache changes and all different, you know. So I wanted to point out that uh, anything that you see with that clipboard is from Daryl Kern's work, where he um, has a series that he's done, Moments in Photo History or American Rituals. And what he would do is um, put where we were and you know, where the person was and the date and what was going on. So that's what this is from. And Daryl has a show up right now in Los Angeles of this work. That's how we all know what happened you know, in our lives is from Daryl. And this was from that symposium I told you where he read the newspaper. There's Daryl in the background. This is actually from a film about Nancy. Okay, I put these in because I didn't think that they would be in the show, but I thought it was so amazing that Robert started to do these iPad drawings. And I just have three of them to show you. But anything that came out of his hand looked like he made it. You could always tell it was Robert's work. So this is one that he sent out, which um, he said was a self-portrait. And this is one from my twin collection that he made. I think he's more fascinated with twins than I am, and I'm a twin, so. And this is one that he sent my husband. Okay, so this is where I sort of want to dwell because I felt that I learned a lot from Robert about how to be with students. He never put himself like above the student, right? He always felt like they, you know, it was almost like collaboration. So I don't know, where's David Yeager? Do you recognize yourself? Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> we all had a lot more hair then. So when Robert first moved to Tallahassee, 
he um, drove across country and he rented a house and in that house David lived in that house and uh, Fred Ensley lived in the house and then and they were students that he brought with him to be students of his in Tallahassee and then also Don Suggs who was um, hired to te teach in Florida with him and it was this kind of old house that was freezing but I thought how interesting that he would live in the house with his students like everybody was kind of equal in that house and then the one interesting thing I thought about it was that every night uh, one of them was assigned to cook a meal so one night it was David's turn one night it was Fred's turn and one night it was Robert's turn and if I was through town then one night it would be my turn and Dawn's turn am I right there David yeah them right yeah okay so he had a very special relationship with his students. Okay, so um, Victor Schrager and Ben Davis, and actually Melanie Walker told me she was involved with this as well, started something called the Big Ben Photo Club. And according to Ben, um, he said, I think that the paragraph at the end of the letter that starts, you need not worry, sums up Robert's approach to life and art pretty well. Now, we, a lot of us were members of the Big Ben Photo Club. I was a member. I really never knew what the club did, but I was happy to be in it, <laughs> even though I really knew nothing about it. And what they did was, you know, they would send out, they sent out these questionnaires. And I'm going to read a little bit from Victor Schrager, who's here as well. The Big Ben Photo Club was an exercise in extended irony on Ben's and my part. We having been provided by Robert with the ultimate insider's guide to what is going on in the nascent field of photography, finally being worthy of having a smoke-filled room and we thought we would concoct our own whole earth catalog thinking along this line. Related was an ad we place in Rolling Stone magazine, free, send us your ideas, and we will send you a handsome two-dimensional two -dimensional facsimile of your idea as a keepsake, but nobody took them up on it. I, I will mention that Melanie Walker uh, knew Robert for a very long time because Robert was very good friends with Todd Walker. And so she really knew him as she was growing up as a child. And she called him Uncle Robert even when she was a graduate student. And she still thinks of him as Uncle Robert. And I'm also just going to read a little bit from uh, Tom Whitworth. I have a picture um, of Robert by him. But he said, when I, I said to him, well, do you have any stories about Robert? Anything that you want to tell? I think I'm going to go faster. He said that when his parents came and uh, they said, what are you going to do with your life? Like, you know, you're in graduate school. Now what are you going to do? And he thought, what am I going to do? He said, well, he said, OK, maybe. Um, let's see, Robert, he teaches. He has a fourth floor office and a window. I think I'm going to teach, too. So he was really happy, window. But this is a picture of Robert by Bill J. And one of the things I thought was interesting, we all photographed each other. So we're, we're all in, you know, like in a lot of each other's pictures. This is one of mine. Some of you may have seen those um, baseball cards. This is um, at Home with Man Ray by that student I mentioned, Tom Whitworth. I th um, he wanted to do a tribute to Man Ray, and Robert decided that he would be Man Ray. And this is uh, Robert with Jerry Yulesman. Oh, going backwards. And these are some self-portrait, and this is Robert with his dog, Bailey. Okay, so, uh, where's Emily? Emily, okay. 
This is, um, since I just got the five minute thing, I, I'm just gonna show this and then I'll be finished. But this is absolutely everything you need to know about Robert is in this film clip. Um, but you know what, where's Emily? Before I start, I'm just gonna read one thing um, more by Victor, by Victor Schrager because it's, I think it's important. Other things that jumped to mind, re Robert, he walked into a graduate critique and announced he was applying for a grant to go to India to photograph the future where people worship cows. And he said that Jerry Yulesman had printed his portfolio applying to graduate school with Henry Holmes Smith. That Smith pronounced Victor the only practitioner who had said something meaningful with the dust on his negatives. That the title of a show that Robert did at Light Gallery was Daguerrean Era, featuring the Ed Reinhardt like ruminations of baby Cyclops. That Robert enjoyed the conundrum of larger prints selling for more than smaller ones, in spite of his observation that smaller ones were harder to make. That he was cheerfully dedicated to pessimism of all things, and that he encapsulated all of the above with Tallahassee organic tours his description of graduate study in a Carl Hyacinth-like environment of incipient natural disaster at the hands of unscrupulous, small-minded developers. And now the film is perfect. For years, Robert said that Florida will be covered over with concrete, but I don't think it is yet. Is it? <laughs> okay, everybody, thank, thank you. Thank you, Eileen. I want to find out where I can get one of those Edward Weston Lives shirts. <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs> Adam Strauss is an artist based in Riverhead, New York. Beginning as a photographer and sculptor in the late 1970s, he started making paintings in the mid-1980s that demonstrate an interest in landscapes both sublime and apocalyptic. Like Fichter, Strauss grew up in Florida, where he was deeply influenced by the state's distinctive landscape and developed a deep concern for human impact on the environment. Strauss's work is represented in numerous private and museum collections, including the Parish Art Museum in Bridgehampton, New York, the Liszt Visual Arts Center at MIT, the Mead Art Museum at Amherst, the Tufts University Art Gallery, and the Art Museum at Florida International University in Miami. Strauss studied with Fichter while pursuing his MFA at Florida State University from 1980 to 1982, and today he will reflect upon some of the connections and shared concerns in his work and in Fichter's. Oh. That's you! Oh, that's, what, that's what I'm supposed to talk about. <laughs> you can talk about whatever you want. Um, okay. So and how do I do just this? Just click forward okay, there, great. and if you want some water, there's some right here. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's wonderful to talk about Robert. Um, yeah, I, ca I came into graduate school in 1980 to Tallahassee with about 10 other photo students, and our uh, understanding of art was pretty much that it was eight by 10 black and white prints on uh, nice pieces of white museum board. Uh, Robert, within a week, um, had dissuaded us considerably from that idea. Uh, everybody that there was about, um, well, not everybody understood him. Uh, I have to say, there's about five of them, uh, five of us that thought of him as a complete artistic guru. Me amongst one of them, uh, as one of them, and then there was probably, you know, three of them that thought he was out of his mind. <laughs> 
Um, this is Robert's uh, uh, snapshot of my son about nine years ago. Uh, since studying with him, uh, you know, uh, we've, we've done shows together. I, he rented a studio to me beside his in Tallahassee where I worked, and he was instrumental in getting me a job at FSU running the photo lab, which got me out of house painting and horrible jobs. <laughs> Uh, he was so important to so many of us doing those same kind of things for us. Um, there were houses that he owned in Tallahassee that he would rent to faculty and art students at very reasonable rates. Um, I realize now that he was kind of running a nonprofit <laughs> Victor arts organization because there was no way, now being a homeowner, there was no possible way that he was keeping those houses up and paying the mortgages on them with the rent that he was charging us. So anyway, okay, that's, um, what else did I want to say? That's, <coughs> this is uh, Robert's studio a couple years ago, a couple summers ago. He asked uh, me to come down and try to excavate him from the building which he had been working in for, what, 45 years or so. And a lot of it was already up here, but there were still numerous things to go through. And we started just sifting through everything and putting it into a pod to come up here to the collection. And my son was with me, who you see in the previous slide, he's in the white t-shirt there. And after a day of going through things and every gadget you could imagine to take photographs with, and drawings and paintings and materials and just uh, unbelievable stuff. My son, on the way back to the hotel we were staying at, said, you know, this guy's really operating on a whole different level from the rest <laughs> of us. And he was, he was 14 at the time, and I thought, wow, that's, yeah, okay, that's, that's it, that's, that's Victor. Uh, this is the pod that we loaded to come up here, and I had decorated it for, for Robert, kind of specially, you know. Um, this is my work before I got to Tallahassee. I was doing kind of, I'd studied with Yulesman and Yvonne Streetman, and I developed these techniques actually before I worked with Yulesman, but um, you know, was certainly influenced by him. And I was, uh, so I was doing these images. Robert looked at a group of these uh, in our, one of our first meetings and said, you know, Adam, what if there's another planet somewhere out there in the universe, and they're feeding completely off of our photographic information. <laughs> Your intent might be benevolent, but how would they know? So he was basically saying, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what he was basically saying. I got it to be, I, I took it to mean, know what the hell you're doing if you do it, you know, like, uh, and do whatever you want to do, but no. This is uh, like within a week of getting to Tallahassee and working with Robert. Um, I just, I, you know, I didn't have an art background actually. My, art, my background was in science and then I'd done photography. So I had no painting, drawing background. And Robert, Robert just, but, and, and everybody I know that worked with Robert, it was the same way. He broke down barriers. He immediately broke down barriers and showed artists that there was just such a wide range of possibilities and to explore them and to do. And I remember the first night of his workshop in, in 1980 saying, do something every day, whether it's bad or good, and just know where the garbage can is, you know, throw it away if you don't like it, do something every day. I, I actually used that, that phrase uh, with a student that I just took on this last Saturday. I said, do, you know, I was thinking of Robert. I said, go back, go do something every day. This is before Robert. This is after. <laughs> Then all hell broke loose. And I, I found a slide of this and I, I scanned it and I looked at it and I went, Jesus, that's Donald Trump. 
I mean, that was, this is 1980. It was a tiny ceramic hand. And, you know, on all these cartoons, they keep, um, you know, his hands, he's got a hand thing. His hands are, you know, he, I, I mean, whatever. He's got a hand problem. Uh, this is my graduate show uh, two years later. So if you look at that black and white print and you think of two years, I mean, at the time, it seemed like a long time. Two years is like a blip to go from those little black and white prints to this in two years, and Robert's partially responsible for this, you know, for really, do it, go do it. You're thinking about, don't tell me about it, go do it, you know. Um, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of Victorisms, which I'll, I'll have to pull out and read. Uh, this is sculpture that I started doing in the late 80s. Uh, there's actually, this is one of the probably most elaborate frames for a photograph um, I ever made. I don't know if, uh, it's about, stands about six and a half feet tall. It's called prison space. You look through the slot and there's a tiny black and white photograph of a vast expanse. So what it came from was fighting the death penalty, having uh, friends that ended up in jail, um, you know, growing up in Miami, I, I had a lot of friends that ended up in the drug trade and ended up in jail, and my concerns with the death penalty and protesting the death penalty outside of the prison in Florida, I was very interested in, in political <coughs> action and the prison, and I thought, like, what would you think about, what image would you like to look at if you were in jail? And I thought, well, a vast expanse, so that's... That's, and that was kind of the beginning of, of, of framing things. This is in, in Robert's studio that he rented me next door to his on 8th Avenue. Uh, this is called Semi-Portable War Memorial. And both of us shared that, that, you know, that concern with, with politics, with society, and, but also that humor, that love of humor and satire at the time, they kept, um, you know, putting up Vietnam War memorials. This is the late 80s. They were going up all over the place. And I thought, well, you know, why don't, why don't we just make a semi-portable one so we can move it around? And then I was, I mean, it was basically to, to mean like, well, you know, if you stop getting into meaningless wars, maybe we would stop needing the memorials. You know, that was also kind of what... This is a, a Senate campaign I did out of the studio. Uh, Robert rented me. Uh, Robert was really, he was acting chair at the time, and he didn't stop me from having students uh, go into the bathrooms and get toilet paper and paper towels, and we would unroll the toilet paper and stamp each square with Adam Strauss for U.S. Senate and put it back in the bathrooms of FSU. And Robert, Robert uh, loved this, and he, he always thought like, and when you register to become a write-in candidate, you, you, to legally become the candidate, you get all these invitations to speak at these interest groups. And he thought like, well, Adam, you, gotta, you really ought to do that. And I said, Robert, I'm not a performance artist. I want to do my sculpture, you know. I don't, so, so I didn't, but I probably should have, I should have done some of them. But, an article, somebody heard about this and did an article and it went out on Associated Press and I got so many votes it was more than the difference between Connie Mack, who was really conservative, and Buddy McKay, this is 1988, that I could have been a spoiler. I could have gotten <laughs> Connie Mack elected. So that was, that was the last time I entered politics like that. And I think Robert voted for me, actually. Uh, my family didn't even vote for me because it was going to be a, it was going to be a, a, a close election. It's one of the first paintings I did, American Landscape. It's with house paint uh, rubbed through. And this is, again, this kind of, uh, I, I don't know. I see, I see Robert's influence ebb and, and, you know, leave and come back. Through until now, I'll show I'll show a couple things that are very Robert-esque. This is a uh, Moonrise McDonald's. Uh, this is more recent. This is man searching for the end of destruction. Uh, 
Uh, again, I think you know, kind of a kind of a Fichter esque influence. It's a, a from a photograph of, of uh, World War II of uh, Cologne, Germany, uh, where the cathedrals were actually stayed standing. They were bombed. It was bombed to smithereens the town, and it says, and there's a tiny figure with a flashlight uh, in the foreground. This this was uh, speaking of technical stuff. Um, this came from the mezzotint filter on Photoshop, and I figured out how, I was wondering how the hell can I do it with paint? So I would splatter with this tiny brush liquid paint onto the canvas. And this is big, this is probably 60 by 70 inches or so. This is new, uh, this is, I would, I would say that, that I've been thinking a lot about Robert since Trump was elected. And I think <laughs> in terms of my work, I mean, it was very peaceful for, actually during the Obama years, it was somewhat peaceful. And then Trump was elected and I went back to being more like, you know, this, this kind of happy Armageddon, maybe, you know, I mean, or, I, I, I mean, I never saw Robert as, as a pessimist. I always saw him as a realist. And, and really kind of in certain ways as an optimist because of his incredible humor. And he always looked at, he's, he's always looked at everything in a humorous way. And, uh, you know, that, that is very positive to me. He's, it, I, th I think he sees it as a circus, as, as everything. Uh, this is No Country for Marlboro Men. This is new. Let's set another. Uh, and this, uh, uh, we were in a show together in 1999. We did a show in, uh, uh, in the Panhandle of Florida, and Robert was asked to invite a student to show with, so we showed. And after the, after the opening, uh, we both did a talk, and Robert said something, one of, one of his million things that he said over the years that I thought was so great. He said, neither Adam or I are afraid of a dumb joke. <laughs> and this is my latest dumb joke. We're doing a show, I'm curating shows with a friend of mine who's a painter out in Long Island, and we're doing a show uh, uh, inspired by Bob Ross, the TV painter, the horrible kitsch TV painter. And Bob Ross had a pet squirrel named Peapod. So this is Peapod desperately seeking a happy place. <laughs> and the, the mountain is kind of uh, melting, etc. But the, but the squirrel is right there. He's just... Uh, this, is, uh, this is Robert's dumb joke. This is with Daryl Kieran yeah. and from, tell us about that. <laughs> this is from a book, uh, Collectible Moments that is uh, the Pasadena Art Museum Norton Simon collection of photographs and throughout the book are these sections that uh, just about all of them have Robert doing something kind of silly in them. Anyway, so that's it. <laughs> so it's been, that's all I have. But uh, other than saying that it's been an incredible pleasure, you know, to have known you for 40 years now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much to all of the speakers. Um, I'd like to open it up in case anybody else wants to sort of share or has questions for any of the speakers. Anyone? Or if the speakers have questions for each other. If not, we can have our conversations over some Prosecco and snacks at the reception. And I just want to thank everyone again for joining us in celebrating this exhibition and celebrating Robert Fick.
and this is so yeah, put me to sleep. I was looking for you.